Hello, and welcome. The following clip is a segment from our most recent podcast episode, that being part eight of the Praxis Table Talks analysis of Julius Evola's Revolt Against the Modern World. In that episode, we cover the first chapter of the second part of the book, which is titled The Doctrine of the Four Ages. It's about a two-hour watch, and the subject matter entirely focuses on Evola's and the traditionalists' doctrine of the yugas. So while it is episode 8 in our analysis and we're pretty deep into the book, I would say it does a good job at functioning as a standalone episode on the subject, and I would recommend watching it in its entirety. However, the segment shown here is of the most significance, as we consult various sources for the mathematics behind the progression of the Four Ages. We hope you enjoy. The Doctrine of the Four Ages um, is the first chapter of the second part of the book, and this was a very prominent idea for the proponent, uh, the proponents of capital T tradition. And I'm sure we are all familiar with the idea of the doctrine of the four ages by now in this part of the book, um, you know, with reference to the Kali Yuga and whatsoever. Um, but an interesting note before we actually jump into this, um, this was something that uh, I have been wanting to say on this podcast for quite some time, but I've never really found a place in which to say it but uh this is it is it is very interesting information so um yeah let's let's we'll, we'll get into that first so as i said the doctrine of the four ages was a very prominent idea for the proponents of capital t traditionalism now i was watching a podcast by a man named sayad nizamuddin ahmad and he is a professor i believe of islamic studies he is uh, a muslim himself and he uh has a very big occult sciences library, uh, among other things, and he's very well learned in uh, religious studies and, and things like that. And so he actually is the one who I got a lot of this information from. It was this podcast that I got a lot of this information from. And after I watched that, I did some research of my own just so I could uh, piece together the, the information I received from that podcast um, and and provide a little bit more of it myself. But I would like to give him credit just because, uh, you know, if I were to have done something like that, I would have wanted credit myself. So there's his credit. Go check out that podcast. I will link it in the description below. Um, it's a very, very good uh, description of the idea of the doctrine of the four ages, according to Rene Ganon and a few other esotericists, which I'll bring up in a minute. So the doctrine of the four ages obviously is what corresponds to the decline in human civilization over a given period of time. Each yuga is a, uh, an age in a cycle, and as the ages progress, humanity, the, qual the qualitative state of humanity, decreases as the ages go on. So as, as each age is further removed from the golden age, in which there, were, there was no bad, right? No sin, no anything. This is you know, pure spirituality. Um, as each age is removed from this time period, you get a decay in the qualitative state of humanity up until the age of darkness or uh, the Iron Age or the Kali Yuga in which there is next to no good. So, um, and this is very well expressed in Hindu doctrine. This is why Hinduism is the sort of um, the model on which the doctrine of the ages rests and you can find these in different civilizations as well but the hindu doctrine is very well thought out it is very well calculated and there's a lot of numbers and um it's very well fleshed out a very 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 well fleshed out system and so if you were to take time as a whole and you know we talked about time in the in the previous episode and you were to you know look at these larger enumerations of time that you know uh, lined up with other enumerations to make even larger units of, you know, um, going back until you have these super, you know, super huge units of time that the human mind can't even wrap its head around until you get to um, eternity. Um, the largest of these in Hindu scripture um, is called the days of Brahma and Brahma being the, you know, like the highest um, God. And the days of Brahma are called a Kalpa. And a kalpa is an aeonic period of time considered to be between the creation and recreation of a world or a universe, quote unquote, um, which lasts about 4 billion years. So a kalpa 
lasts about 4 billion years, and these correspond to a day or a night of Brahma, so 12 hours of a day of Brahma. So each Kalpa is 12 hours of Brahma, whatever that means. <laughs> um, so a Kalpa consists of 14 Manvantaras, and a Manvantara is considered to be an age of Manu, and Manu is considered to be the archetypal man. It's what we've identified to be Novus Kivis. So a Manvantara is supposed to be an age of Manu, or an age of the archetypal man. And a Kalpa consists of 14 of these. And a Manvantara consists of 71 Yuga cycles. So in turn, a Kalpa consists of 1,000 Yuga cycles. And every Yuga cycle lasts about 4 million years. So you have the Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, and the Kali Yuga. That's one Yuga cycle. And every Manvantara consists of 71 of these cycles. And this, and this extends up until, the, until you reach the days or nights of Brahma. And so each yuga, like I said, has the, each yuga cycle has the four yugas that, you, that the uh, traditionalists talk about. And each yuga is a proper, uh, each yuga proper is a division of time in which the general state of humanity, like I said, qualitatively decreases by a fourth of what it was in the previous yuga. So if you have the golden age, like I said, the silver age, the, the state of humanity will be one-fourth less of what it was in the Golden Age. In the Bronze Age, it will be two-fourths less of what it was in the Golden Age. And in the Iron Age, it will be three-fourths less until you get to a state that is so far, the, so far removed from the Golden Age that the state of humanity is absolutely decayed and we are into a new cycle. And so um, the, the idea here is that every division of time in the Yuga Cycle can be further divided up according to the Pythagorean Tetractus. This is the um, this is the image that I sent you of the triangle. Uh, I will put it up on the screen now. So the Pythagorean Tetractus is um, let's see here. It's a an, it's an image in which things in which there are ten units, ten dots, ten points, as it were, and they are organized in the fashion of four on the bottom, three on the row above, uh, two on the row above, and one on the on the top, and it organizes itself into a nice equilateral triangle. And this is used in Pythagorean mathematics or esoteric geometry to represent uh, sort of like the monad, the dyad, the triad, and all of that. Um, there are lots of uses for the Pythagorean tetractus, but what it does, what the, the reason it's relevant to us is because it breaks down units of 10 into divisions of four, three, two, and one. And so th this is how the ages progress, as it were. And so I will, um, I will give a another timeline. This is the second image I sent you with the bronze aged, um, with the bronze, silver, uh, iron and gold and whatnot. Um, I put that up on the screen now too. So if you look at the second image, there's a sort of timeline of 10 units. And four of these units are taken up by a golden period Three of these units are taken up by a silver period, two of these units are taken up by a bronze period, and one of these units is taken up by an iron period. So the, the period of time that corresponds to the Golden Age is obviously the, Sat the Satya Yuga, or the first Yuga. The second is the Silver Age, or the uh, Treta Yuga. And the, second, uh, the, the third, with the number two that corresponds to two units, uh, is the Bronze Age, the Third Age, or the Dwapara Yuga. And then the last one, of course, is the Kali Yuga. And so... The Kali Yuga is um, one-tenth of a Yuga cycle, whereas the Golden Age, for example, is four-tenths of a Yuga cycle. So they, they, take up longer peri or they take up shorter periods of time as the ages progress. The decay sort of snowballs, and it becomes more rapid as it, as it descends. So, uh, like I said, these were divided up into proportions of units uh -oh. of... You're um, fueling the fire of accelerationism. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, but it's true. As these, even in uh, in in the timelines, this is not just Hindu, but I've used Hindu as an example. It's as as the decay progresses, it becomes more rapid. It's very, um, it's very interesting. So anyways, different calculations existed for these durations depending on the source. Like I said, the Greeks had a similar idea for cyclical time, um, in which the yugas, like I said, corresponded to the um, 
golden, silver, bronze, and iron ages. Like I said, the golden age corresponds to the Satya Yuga, silver to the Treta Yuga, bronze to the Dwapara Yuga, and the iron to the Kali Yuga. Now, Rene Ganon, who, um, you know, is a, a um, the progenitor of the traditionalist ideas before Evola, was a very big inspiration on Evola's writing. He suggested that a Yuga cycle, instead of lasting, what was it, 1,000 years? No, 4 million years. <laughs> uh, he suggested that a Yuga cycle, instead of lasting 4 million years, actually lasted 64,800 years. And so that would mean that a Yuga cycle, like I said, is 64,800 years, that if you do these divisions, as it were, the Satya Yuga would last about 25,920 years. The Treta Yuga would last about 19,440 years. The Dwapara Yuga would last about 12,960 years. And the Kali Yuga would be one tenth of that. It would last 60, uh, it would last 6,400 years or, or 6,480 years. Now, most sources, whether it be Hindu scripture or Ganon or um, Robert Bolton, who's another um, person I'll bring up in a minute, most of these sources state that the Kali Yuga started in 3102 BC. So according to these calculations, if you were to um, take these durations of time that Ganon stated, the Kali Yuga will end in 3378 AD. But the thing is that Ganon himself was a bit vague with his calculations, and he didn't claim to know all the answers. So he didn't really use the uh, the 4321 idea as, as, as we have... Uh, outlined it here. So, um, more relevant to this idea is a man named Robert Bolton, who was an English academic and theologian. And Robert Bolton lived from 1572 to 1631. And he, w he tried to determine and predict the actual durations for these various segments of time. So he was more interested in the, you know, figuring out when the Kali Yuga will actually end and what these events correspond to. So, according to him, the Kali Yuga, or the Iron Age, still began in 30, uh, 30, 3102, I believe it was. Yeah, 3102. And it will end in 2082 AD. So, in about 59 years. And so this means that there are 5,184 years in the Kali Yuga, and that to the times, to times that by 10 would give us a Yuga cycle of 51,840 years. Um, that would mean that the Golden Age began in 49,000 BC, Silver Age in 29,000 BC, Bronze Age in 13,000 BC, which lasted up until uh, 3,102 BC. And then the Kali Yuga lasts from 3,102 to 2,082. Now, if you were to consider only that last segment from 3,102 to 2,082 and apply the same idea of 4, 3, 2, 1 proportions, apply the same scale, so you're talking about the Iron Age, right? And you're subdividing it into its own golden, silver, bronze, and iron sub-ages, right? You would get these calculations, and these are very interesting. The golden age, or the golden sub-age of the Iron Age is 3102 BC to 1026 BC. That's the golden sub-age of the Iron Age. 1026 BC to 528 AD is the silver, the silver sub-age of the Iron Age. And then 528 AD to 1564 is the bronze sub-age. And then um, from 1564 to 2082 is the iron sub-age, uh, or, or the Kali Yuga of the Kali Yuga, as it were. But if you look at the first, if you look at the golden sub-age of the Iron Age, it corresponds very nicely to the beginning of the first ancient Egyptian dynasty in 3150 BC and the collapse of the Greek Bronze Age in 1050 BC. It almost lines up perfectly. 3102 to 1026 lines up very nicely to 3150 and 1050. And these are, you know, approximations because we don't actually have the concrete dates for these things. And then if you look at the silver sub-age of the Iron Age, it lines up very nicely with the duration of classical antiquity from 1026 to 528 lines up very nicely with the collapse of the Greek Bronze Age and the duration of um, classical antiquity up until the fall of the Roman Empire. And then the bronze sub-age also... Uh, from 528 to 1564, it corresponds to the medieval period, almost to a T, um, depending on which scholar you ask. If, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire to 
the colonization of the Americas, it, it lines up very nicely. And then uh, from 1564 to 2082, it begins with the Protestant Reformation, and it continues until what I would amateurly predict to be the death of secular liberal hegemony. So these line up very nicely. Now, <laughs> if you were to... And I just want to say, too, um, going back to the larger ages from the calculations of Roger... Uh, what was it? Roger Bolton? Uh, Robert, it? Robert Bolton. Um, which I did hear those... Robert Bolton, excuse me. I did hear those calculations before, but I forgot who it was that made them because I, I was going to bring those up, um, but I didn't want to do so unsourced, so I'm glad you did. Uh, his calculations and going back and applying them to um, the larger scale of the, the Yuga cycles actually lines up fairly well with geological time frames and what we understand of um, the Earth as well and what what we were mentioning of uh, Evola pointing to towards the origins of certain uh, civilizations like Hyperborea and Atlantis and whatnot. And though he do doesn't make any definitive claims, it points to things like uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and Doggerland, um, which on a time scale of the uh, last ice age or the uh, glacial maximum, as it's called in many circles, is almost exactly right here with the calculations of the Bronze Age for... Um, the that uh, period uh, at least for like the atlantean um devolution there and then would set again in the um thawing off of the uh the ice age going into this post-diluvian um rebirth of civilization in the iron age so i just thought that was interesting as well absolutely yeah i'm sure i haven't done much research on uh, prehistory as as Evola has, or probably as you have even. Um, so I wouldn't be able to comment on anything about, uh, you know, such things. But I think that, yeah, from, from what I do know, from the little tiny bits that I do know, these ages nicely line up with uh, with different events. And they're, they're bound to. The thing is, is that they're bound to. Because this 4321 application corresponds very nicely to the speed of decay in society. Um, so... You know, if you were to like, if you were to once again take that last segment, right? So now you're considering, you're considering the Iron Sub Age of the Iron Age, or what is from 1564 to 2082. If you were just to, if you were just to consider that period, and you were to divide that up into units of four, three, two, and one, so you're now examining the, like I said, the Iron Age of the Iron Age, <laughs> or what we call, uh, you know, the the um, Iron. No, you're, you're examining the, the Iron Age of the Iron Sub-Age. The Iron Age of the Iron Age of the Iron Age. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, if you were to... If you Let's were to, call it real steel. Yeah, if you were to examine the Iron Period of the Iron Sub-Age, how about that? We'll, we'll call it that. Um, you, were, you would get a golden period from 1564 to 1770. And then you would get a silver period of 1770 to 1926. You would get a bronze period of 1926 to 2030, and then you would get a iron period from 2030 to 2082. So we would still be in the bronze period. But these are all calculations that are based off of somebody who didn't, who, who died before all of these dates that I just mentioned are uh, have even come to pass. So the golden period of the iron sub age from 1564 to 1770 it goes from what is left of the Renaissance and the decaying but still traditional monarchical regimes. It goes up from there up until the birth of the first liberal republics in the 1770s. And then the silver period of 1770 to 1926, those are the early, uh, the early years of American society. And, uh, you know, the, this, this silver period includes a, a little bit more decay, you know, the revolutions of 1848. Um, it, go, it has, you know, emancipation, yeah, the... the that the death of um, European monarchies yeah, after yeah. World War One, and then you get the uh, Industrial Revolution, the the plebeianizing of what was the uh, American pseudo aristocratic republic, and then, like you said, it, it culminates in World War One, and then it it, uh, it ends in the interwar years, and then this Bronze Period from 1926 to 2030, it's it's where the trends that have shaped the current world into what it is have their birth. It's it's you know the Great Depression and we, what, what we now call post-modernity. Right, exactly. Uh, the Great Depression. Sorry to interrupt. No, you're, no, you're perfectly fine. 
uh, World War II shortly followed the, the trajectories um, that were set in this period. And uh, yeah, these trajectories solidify into um, post-modernity. And then the Iron Period, like I said, uh, we can only predict that drastic changes are incoming. But you can play around with this gold, silver, bronze, iron, uh, iron idea, or the 4-3-2-1 idea, and you can apply it to any length of time, and you'll be able to tell with surprising accuracy the quality of the time periods associated with those proportions. It's very interesting. And uh, remember, Robert Bolton lived in the 15 and 1600s, so he predicted, again, with surprising accuracy, the decades um, of the American and French revolutions, and really everything that came after his time. So I figured that that was very interesting, and uh, that's that that is um, that that was that would be good to include on this episode. 